Welcome back to our series on Applied Regression Analysis. I'm Mark Ledbetter. This is Lecture Video 30. This is Chapter 9, Part 2. Let's review what we talked about last time. We were testing for the overall uh, regression equation. Does the whole model, is it significant? And so we can think of the null hypothesis as um, H0 of beta 1 equals beta 2, equals beta 3, etc., and we have k of these, however many that is, they all equal 0. So since they all equal 0, they all equal the, uh, each other, and then we could write the alternative HA as beta i not equal to 0 for some i equals or n 1 to k. So if at least one of them is not equal to zero, then the whole test is rejected. All right. But that is a big test, right? And so if we reject it and we say the regression is significant, that doesn't mean that all of the variables in there are significantly contributing, does it? So here is our here was our test for overall h not one way we could say it is all k independent variables considered together do not explain a significant amount of the variation in y that's one way to say the null which is that there is no effect the regression equation is no good it doesn't do anything to help us predict y and the other way to say the same thing is there is no significant overall regression using all k independent variables in the model and again, as I said, the alternative is that at least one beta i is not zero. So, so there is, so if we reject the null, in this case, we're saying that at least one of these variables help us predict y, um, but we don't know exactly which one or how many of them. So that's the reason that we'll perform the test that we're talking about today. But this overall test could be uh, obtained from the uh, ANOVA table, and we take MSR, which is the mean square of regression, divided by MSE, and of course the MSR is the SSR over its degrees of freedom, which is K, and the MSE is the SSE, the sum of squares error, divided there by their degrees of freedom, which in this case is N minus K minus 1. And we've given SSR and SSE here just to remind you that SSR is the difference between the regression line values, the predicted values, and the mean, and SSE is the difference from the actual value of y to the predicted value of y. That's the sum of squares error. And we can show that the F statistic could also be uh, expressed as R squared if we wanted to go through that deviation, uh, derivation, not deviation, derivation if we wanted to. Uh, I'm not going to, and I, I don't believe I did last time. So under the null hypothesis, the F statistic follows a F distribution. So I could write F with K numerator degrees of freedom, N minus K minus 1 denominator degrees of freedom, and... Um, then, so that's, so this would be simply k n minus k minus 1, and then the critical value would be this um, statistic here. I'll zoom in. So that's f uh, with k degrees of freedom in the numerator, n minus k minus 1 in the denominator, and at the point 1 minus alpha, saying that to the right of this f, to the right, is 1 minus alpha, and so alpha is above it. So that means that the, the probability under the null that we uh, reject the null hypothesis when it's really true is alpha. Okay, that's our type 1 error. So our rejection region is if f k n minus k minus 1 1 minus alpha is greater than F calculated. Okay? So or the calculated F value, which this is F calculated. Okay? So that was what we covered last time. This time, so that was an F test. This time, we're going to cover the partial F test. And I've decided to do this in one video so that it's not piecemeal. So this may be a longer video, but I think it's worth our uh, time to do one video rather than 
several small ones and then have to remember where we left off. Okay, so we're going to look at the nutritional deficiency data that had the weight, the height, and the age. Okay, and the dependent variable is uh, y, which is the weight, and the independent variables were x1, height, and age. And so we're going to look at the following uh, ANOVA table and let it represent, um, we're going to give some additional information than we've given before. Remember, this is called a partial F-test. And so this ANOVA table has the sum of squares regression broken out into three uh, parts. And we'll explain what these are in a minute. So now there are actually three F-tests over here. And we still have our R squared. And then we have residual or error. Same thing. So please get used to seeing both. Um, and total or SSY is uh, here. Okay. So um, we have our mean squares. We have our sum of squares. We have the F test. Um, so we'll talk about what these F tests are and what they mean. So I've repeated the table here so that we have it. So there's we have partitioned the regression into three parts in this case. So we're using this example to explain uh, this specific thing, but hopefully it's enough to give you the general idea that we could extend this beyond three variables. All right, so be thinking about the patterns here and what's being said and so that you'll be able to extend it. So this is going to require us to think and to think through the problems uh, when we solve these types of problems. So the partition of the regression sum of squares, SSR, are these three. So the first is SSX1. And we could choose this whichever one of these we wanted to first. We just chose the ones we just called X1 height. And so um, we, we could have called it age and started with age. We could have called it... Um, uh, whatever x1, uh, whatever x3 is, I think that's age squared. So we could have started with any one of these that we wanted to first, and it would change um, this by whichever one is put in first. Um, you'll see how that goes. So SSX1 is the sum of squares by explain, explained by using only x1, which is height, to predict y. So if we only put x1 in there, how well... Um, do we do? Are we significant or not? And yes, it uh, looks like we are very significant. Um, there's an S, there's two asterisks there, and um, I didn't print that part of the table, um, but it's 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 going to be highly significant. Okay, and then, uh, or I think it's significant. We'll have to check. We'll we'll see later on. So I, I don't want to make uh, statements when I don't have the F table memorized. All right. So this is only due to height. Now, SS, the sum of squares, x2 given x1. This is conditional. So given that x1 is already in the equation, how much extra is added to the sum of squares of regression? So how much extra is explained? How much extra sum of squares are exp explained? So this would be the amount of this is the amount that was taken from the original value here. It was moved from the original value up to here, and the remainder is what's left down here, the 195. Okay, so before we added this in, before we added this in, this all would have been in error, the error sum of squares. Okay. So by adding in x2, we've removed 103.9 from the error sum of squares, and now at this point, we have um, only those two left in the uh, sum of squares residual or error, okay? So this is the amount of variation explained by adding x2 to the model once we already have x1 in the model. Okay. This is very different than x2 by itself. Okay. And so then we do the same thing with the third part here, where we now say we have x1 and x2 are both put into the model. How much extra amount of variation is explained by adding 
x3, which in this case is aged, to the regression model. And you see that number is very small. Okay? Okay. And so we'll see that the f value is 0.01, really close to zero. Um, so uh, not, not significantly above one. Remember that to reject the null hypothesis, you have to be, f needs to be significantly above one. Well, this is below one. I can easily say we do not reject h naught here. Okay, so it didn't add very much, right? 0.24, very small percentage. Okay, so we've still got the table. So here's what we can answer. These are the questions we can answer by partitioning this sum of squares regression this way. Does height alone significantly contrib contribute to predicting y? Okay, so that would be the first question. That, that's what's answered by this line here and this f statistic. So this is f equals 19.67. And then this second line here, and that F statistic, we can say, does the addition of age significantly contribute uh, to the prediction of Y after we account for, or you can call it controlling for, the contribution of X? So if you hear the word controlling for, you have to really think, is it this situation or not? Because there's other situations where we're going to talk about this, and COVA is one of them, and that's going to be somewhat different. Okay, so this is one of the situations where we could call it control. So, but we're really already, we've already accounted for X1, how much additional um, uh, contribution to prediction of Y does it make by adding X2 into this model? And then finally, the third line here, and this F statistic, so this was F equals 4.78, and you'll see that he included the p-value, and the p-value is, is between 0.05 and 0.1. So while it's not highly significant, it's not less than 0.05, which is the normal, it is less than 0.1. So in many cases, I would say, and many people would say, leave it in the model. It is significant enough to add to the prediction, okay? But we'll talk about that. And so this third question is, does adding age squared significantly contribute to predicting Y after we've already put X1 and X2 in the model? Once X1 and X2 are in the model, how um, is it significant? Is it a significant amount of variation that's explained by also then adding X3, which is age squared? And with this smaller number, like I said, without even looking at the F table, I can tell you no. Okay. Now, let's look at the R squared real quick. 78.02% is explained by putting all three of these into the uh, model. Okay. Which is a, a high amount. Um, but we'll talk about that. So, we have these null hypotheses. So, we want to test whether adding X star whichever that is, significantly improves the prediction of Y given that X1 through XP are already in the model. Okay, so we're generalizing this now. And so X star is just some other variable that are not X1 to XP. It's some outside of X1 to XP. So this is how we can state the null hypothesis that um, H1 in the model. So this is H0 beta um, star equals zero, so that's the null hypothesis. And um, this is um, in the model here, okay? So beta star. So you see that we have this extra term. Let me, so this extra term, here's, here's beta naught, here's beta one through beta p, and then here is beta star. And so beta 1 goes with x1 up to beta p with xp, and beta star goes with x star, whatever variable that is. And don't forget your, don't forget your um, error here. And my cat is uh, waking up from a bad dream, apparently. So um, sorry about the noise in the background. So in other words, h0, there's another way to say h0. 
its x star does not significantly contribute to the prediction of y given that the variables x1 to xp are already in the model. Okay, so, so we can say that um, the, the null hypothesis here can be stated or, or, or thought of as x star, this extra variable, does not significantly contribute to the prediction of y given that we already have x1, x2, all the way up to xp in the model, okay? So I hope that helps explain our thoughts here uh, more than just symbols, right? <clears throat> and so the test is going to really compare these two models. The full model is what it contains x1, x2, up to xp, and x star. And we're comparing that to what we call a reduced model that only contains x1 to xp, not x star, okay? So that's, in effect, what this test here, this partial F test we're going to go over, um, test for, okay? Versus, yes, it does. It does significantly um, contribute, okay? And we should include it in the model. So we need to define the sum of the extra sum of squares this way. And so this is something you want to make sure that you, you get. So the sum of x, sum of squares, x star given x1 to xp is equal to the sum of squares regression x1 to xp with x star minus the sum of squares with a regression with just x1 to xp, okay? Another way to write this is um, we can do, let's see, so we can do SS, so this is the sum of squares. We can also rewrite this as the sum of squares of x star given x1 to xp equals the sum of squares error. This was regression, this is error, of x1 to xp minus the sum of squares x1 to xp and x star. Why is it backwards? You'll notice that we kind of flipped the direction here of what we have. Well, um, because the sum of squares, error, remember, SSE equals uh, SSY minus SSR. So when we have um, more variables in the model, it's smaller. This, is sm this, this should be smaller. It, it will be smaller, it's just how much, than this one, which will be larger, right? Because the more variables we put in, S, in, in the model, the larger SSR is, and thus the smaller SSE is. Oh, yeah, and here it is right there. Okay. So I um, want to remind you that the um, book uses a little bit different notation. Instead of SSR, they use regression SS, and SSE, they use residual SS. So um, please try to keep that in mind when you read the book. Okay. So in our example, the sum of squares of x2 given x1 would be the sum of squares x1 and x2 minus the sum of squares x1. And so let's see if that's in our table. We've got 692 and 588. See what we have here. And we don't have those in this table. So let me help with this. What we could do is we can create a new ANOVA table here. And unfortunately, here, I have a little bit of room over here. So let's say I have source. Whoops. I have source. And I have regression. And so just and, and so this is going to be just x1. And then degrees of freedom would be 1. SS would be 588.92. And then SSE, or actually I'm going to say uh, residuals or error. would be uh, degrees of freedom, 8, 9. We're going to combine all of these because the only thing we have in our model is that one. So we're combining all of these, and so that is um, 10. And the total stays the same. Remember, 888.25. 8, and so what we do is we, we now, all of these go together. 
So you can get this two different ways. You could say 88, 888 minus the 588.92, or <clears throat> you could just add these three that I circled here and get what is in the error. So that is 103.9 plus 0.24 uh, plus 195.19, which gives me 299.33. Okay. And so that's without, um, that's with just the one. Now, let's compare to x1 and x2. So we got source, regression, and now we're going to keep um, both of these. So we're going to keep both of these in the model. So x1, x2. And so that would be um, 588.92 plus 103.9, which gives me 692 for SS, 692.82. And for error, that's going to give me 195 plus 0.24. 195.19 plus 0.24. And that gives me 195, where is it, 195.43. And the total remains 888.25 total. Or this is SSY, that's the other way that's said. So whichever way, so SST or SSY. All right. And then the third model, <clears throat> where we have all three in there, is going to be um, regression, error, total. Oops, that's not how you say total. <laughs> okay. And we've got SS. And so the regression is going to be all three of these values. Okay. So 588.92 plus 103.90 plus 0.24 gives me 693.06. And the error is 195.19. And the total is still 888.25. Okay. So remember that we can do this. We can add these up like this because, <clears throat> because of the way this is written. This is just x1, and this is just the additional for x2 given x1's already in there. And this is just the additional given that x1 and x2 are already in the model. So that's why we can add these this way, which is really nice and makes it easy to do this. So now you'll see I have 692.82 and 588.92. And when we go back down here, um, that is, um, and yeah, so, so see, that's where this number came from. And then we see that our, uh, so then this was our, um, the original for just X1, this was X1 and X2, and 103.90, if we look at this, is, is the amount that was in here, okay? And again, what they're doing is they're saying, what if we had, we ran a regression with just X1, we'd get this. If we ran a regression with X1 and X2, we would get this. So how we get this number here is by taking this value that I've circled for the regression minus this value for the regression. And then the way that we get this value here is to take, and this is for X1, X2, X3. So how we get this 0.24 is we take this value here that we would have gotten if we ran that regression, and subtracted the 692.82, and so the difference is 0.24. So when I first saw this, I didn't realize that this is what how you would really do it, unless the computer does it for you. There are programs that do this, thank goodness. But if you didn't have that, you'd have to run three different models here. And to figure out these conditional values, you'd have to do the subtractions of the regression sum of squares to get those. Okay. All right. And I left out degrees of freedom here in this one. This would be uh, uh, 2 for the regression. And then I didn't put error under here, but error would be um, 
let's see, so this, so error here was uh, 10, and then the total would be 11 still, and the total is still going to be 11, and so the error is going to be 9. Sorry, you can't see that. Whoops, that's the wrong thing. So the error is going to be 9, and here the error is going to be 8, and the regression is going to be 3, and the total would be still be 11. All right. So we would run three different regressions, and then we'd subtract these sum of squares regressions to get the conditional values that are here. Okay? And so that's what this calculation here is doing, is saying. It's saying, okay, I take the sum of squares regression with x1, x2, and subtract the sum of squares regression of just x1. And then to get this conditional sum of squares, I take the sum of squares regression of x1, x2, x3, and I subtract the sum of squares from the regression where I just had x1 and x2 in there and get this value. So I hope that explains it. The first time um, I was introduced to this, I didn't really get what was going on, and I hope that I've helped explain it better. Um, okay, so to test this test, the h naught that beta star is 0 in this model that has x1 to xp and x star, we need to compute f, and that is going to be ss of x star given x1 to xp divided by the MSE of x1 to xp with x star. So, <clears throat> and the f statistic has uh, 1 and n minus p minus 2 degrees of freedom. And so here we're going to do the calculation for f of x2 given x1. So we take the sum of squares of x1 given x2 and divide it by the MSE for x1 and x2. So, um, so the MSE here, um, I want to sum that because that's 195.19 plus 0.24. And so that's 195.43. So let's go up here to our three different models and see where that is. That's 195.43. That's right here. Okay? So we're taking this and dividing by our degrees of freedom to get the, the um, MSE. Or, yeah, for this model, okay? So, let's re recap. Let's make sure that we have this correct. So, we took a 103.9, which is our additional sums of squares. They're explained by adding x2 to the model that already has x1. And we're dividing by the MSE of the model that has x1 and x2 in it. And that model was this second one here. <clears throat> and we're using, M, we'll take MSE, which is going to be SSE divided by the degrees of freedom. Okay, so 195.43. And we calculated this with this, uh, with the table that we're given, we can calculate that. Because if I add these two together, then that is going to be the 195.43. So the book here, they're showing you how to calculate it from this table that they gave, table 9-1. But in real life, you might not have such a table. You might have to create that table using these three different regression models. Okay. So depends on how complex your software is. Okay. So we take this M103.90 divided by 195.43, all divided by 9, and we get 4.78. And this has a p-value of 0.057, okay? And so a computer would give you that. And so if we're using alpha equals 0.05, we do not reject h naught. But if we're using alpha equals 0.1, we're, we, we will reject h naught. Okay, so uh, um, we have to decide, should we put it in the model or not? Personally, um, and most professionally, we would, we would put, include it in the model, unless we had good reason not to. 
Now let's test the addition of X3 to the model. And um, that we take the SS of X3 given X1 and X2, which is right in the table. And then we take the MSE of X1, X2, X3. So let me show you where this 24.4 uh, comes from. It comes from, well, it's right in our table that we were given. It's right here. Um, but we would get it by taking um, 190. So even if we had all three in our, this, in our model, then we could take, again, this divided by this, and that is our MSE for that model. It's also the MSE that's given right here in this table. Okay? So, and the value of F that we get for that is 0 .1, 0 0.01, as I mentioned. And so, the p-value is 0.923. So, that's huge p-value. So, it's certainly not less than alpha. It doesn't matter. We would never use an alpha that big. So, we never, we would, we do not reject h naught. And again, he said, regardless of the significance level, and I agree with that. So we conclude that once x1 and x2 are in the model, the addition of x3, which is h squared, doesn't help in predicting y. I want to caution you. The book does not use the sentences that I require you to use for conclusions. So use the conclusion sentences I have given you previously anytime you perform a test, a hypothesis test. I want to just emphasize that. Okay. So, now we have an alternative. It's called the t-test. And if you've taken um, math 311 or last year, stat 333, <clears throat> you should know that an F statistic that has 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and V, or nu, degrees of freedom um, in the denominator, it's a square of the T statistic. So if I have T with nu degrees of freedom squared, that <clears throat> is equal to F with 1 and nu. Okay? So this is the, uh, these are distributions. And so these uh, test statistics, actually, and they are they are uh, equivalent, okay? So F would have this, these degrees of freedom, 1 in the numerator, N minus P minus 2 in the denominator, and um, it's equivalent to a t-test with N minus P minus 2 degrees of freedom, okay? So you just use the denominator degrees of freedom and use a t-statistic. So here is our h naught, um, and and they like to say, in the model. And I agree, you need to put the model, when you're doing a t hypothesis test for regression or design of experiments, you need to state the model with the um, hypothesis statement, okay? I also want you to state the alternative. And the alternative is going to be not equal to zero uh, unless otherwise specified. So in 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 this regression, we almost always use the not equal to zero as the alternative, which is why the authors don't say it, but I want you to specify it. And the test statistic is going to be, since it's minus zero, that's our, we, we had this form when we reviewed the statistics at the beginning in chapter three, we had this form, general form, and here it is again, but my, minus zero is left off because, you know, minus zero leaves the same thing. So in our example, we're going to consider h naught of beta 3 equals 0 in this model, and instead of using x1, x2, we've put in hdt, age, and age squared, okay? And so the test statistic here would be beta hat 3, um, which is 0 0.0417. Now, um, I don't have that output. I don't believe I have the estimates output here. No. So, um, yeah, so we don't have that to see, but um, uh, we can look back in the book and see from the, um, from the model that that is the value. And then we divide by S of beta 3 hat, which is 0.4224, and that's 
gives us a negative 0.1. That's a very small number. And so look, if we take t squared, as we said, we get 0.01, which is the f value that we had before. So the p value is going to be 0.983 like it was. Uh, 923 or 983? Let's see. 923 like we saw before. Okay, so it's not significant. All right, so again, sorry for the longer uh, video, but I wanted to make sure that I explain this well and that we get through the whole um, section so that it's not piecemeal and confusing. So please don't forget to scan in your lecture notes by midnight, the date listed in the course calendar. Um, you'll want to definitely update your formula sheet with some of the information we went over in this video. If you have questions, come to virtual office hours. If you cannot make it to virtual office hours, then by all means, email me, but send me a picture of your problem because I don't know the problems off the top of my head and send me a picture of your work so I can help you by email. Take care of yourself, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.